Hello, my name is Eduardo Gonçalves. I'm the founder of the campaign to ban trophy hunting, um, and I'm also the author of two books about the subject, Trophy Hunters Exposed and Killing Game. Trophy hunting is an issue that's been much in the news over the last year or so, um, and it's something that the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister have pledged to act decisively on. A promise to ban trophy hunting imports was included in the Queen's speech and also in the Conservative election manifesto. And the Prime Minister told Conservative MP Dame Pauline Latham MP at Prime Minister's questions in February that he would indeed be going ahead with the ban. And the Prime Minister has also taken to social media about it, um, posting a picture of Cecil the lion, the uh, animal famously killed by the American dentist Walter Palmer, um, with the message, it's time to end this barbaric practice. Opinion polls show that Conservative voters strongly support uh, an import ban on trophies. And the Times, in an editorial earlier this year, said that Britain should ban the import of animal trophies adding that the UK is a nation of animal lovers and should not tolerate their persecution. The idea of killing for fun those animals most at risk from disappearing from the wild is an abhorrent one. It also called the government's proposed ban on trophy imports the right course of action. The trophy hunting industry, however, has been fighting back and the proposed ban has been delayed. Supporters of trophy hunting have even made claims that the industry is helping to conserve endangered wildlife and also alleviate poverty in rural Africa. So today we're talking to a number of experts, some of them wildlife experts and also community leaders from Africa, to ask them what they think and who's right. I began by speaking with Boniface Mpario, a senior elder of the Maasai tribes people. He told me about his and other Africans' abhorrence of trophy hunting, how it's accelerating the extinction of endangered species, and why he went to Downing Street earlier this year to hand in a petition with more than one million signatures asking for a trophy import ban. Um, I was born in the Masai Mara in southwestern Kenya, and uh, I live in that area throughout my life. Um, I was born in a typical Maasai village where the children, um, boys look after the livestock while the girls stay in the village. So I was born there and I've been with, uh, you know, wildlife throughout my life and I ended up being a safari guide in the same area in the Maasai Mara Game Reserve. I've got uh, an animal that is very, very um, close to me and it's a small creature called a bat eared fox. Okay. Um, a bat eared fox is what made my life completely different from what it would have been because we used to have a few of them around the fields where we look after the sheep and goats. And I used to go and play with them, not looking after the sheep and goats properly. So, in other words, I was a rubbish herdsman. <laughs> and I'll go playing with them and Bat-eared foxes yeah. are one of the animals that you can go on an African hunting safari to shoot for fun. Oh how, no. How does that make you feel? It really makes me feel sick because that's my favourite animal and I like them a lot and knowing that somebody can literally go and shoot it for fun, you know, it's a terrible, terrible thing and I feel sick even thinking about it. I think it's a terrible, cruel and barbaric idea, you know, somebody go and shoot for fun or shoot because you want to stick a lion's head on the wall, that is absolutely wrong and most of these um, species are endangered, so by you going to hunt just to stick something on the wall while it's an endangered species is very, very wrong. Some people in the trophy hunting industry say that the campaign against trophy hunting is about the West trying to dictate to Africans that this is an African tradition. What do you say to that? I will say that's absolute rubbish. That is not an uh, um, uh, African tradition. For example, go to Kenya. Hunting was banned in Kenya in 1977, and that was it. We never did any uh, trophy hunting, and tourism is doing very well. Conservation areas are increasing. 
And this is because um, we are not killing any animals for trophies or we are not allowing anybody. Nobody's running a trophy hunting safari. So I will say trophy hunting does not help conservation. It helps to eliminate the good genes that are required in the wild for the survival of species. It helps in aiding extinction of endangered species. So trophy hunting should be banned and is not good for conservation at all. Please, please don't hesitate. Go for it. Ban, give a, exactly a total ban on import on trophies into the United Kingdom and hopefully the rest of the world should do so because conservation and hunting don't go together. Boniface Umparius speaking to me a little earlier there. Um, one of the animals most heavily targeted by British trophy hunters are African elephants. British hunters were revealed in a recent report to be one of the worst in the world when it came to shooting elephants for sport and souvenirs. I asked Namusa Duba of the Zimbabwe Elephant Foundation what she thought and who really benefits from trophy hunting. My name is Nomsa Dube. I'm the founder of the Zimbabwe Elephant Foundation, which advocates for a stronger future in coexistence of people and wildlife in Zimbabwe. For decades, rural communities have been sold a lie when it comes to trophy hunting. Local communities who, according to the Constitution Wildlife Act, are the owners of wildlife, and yet they continue to live in abject poverty. Local communities are not benefiting from trophy hunting funds. The only people that are benefiting are professional hunters, the hunting companies and government officials who are intercepting the funds. Hunting quotas and permits are not being based on scientific detrimental findings, but they are being traded by those who know how to play the numbers game. There's a lot of corruption involved and this barbaric medieval sport needs to be banned immediately. Namusa Duba from the Zimbabwe Elephant Foundation speaking there. Trophy hunters often say that local villagers in Africa can profit from international trophy hunters coming and shooting wildlife for trophies. Over the past few months, the campaign to ban trophy hunting has been interviewing local headmen, councillors and MPs in Africa and asked them if this was true. Here are some of the things they had to say. Uh, the communities are not benefiting much from the campfire management system in that it is uh, communal. It benefits the whole community. It doesn't benefit the individuals. The elephants are destructive in nature when they are in the fields, not way in, in, in their habitats. The lion also devour their domestic animals. But the whole compensatory system or the whole campfire system, it's holistic. It, it covers the whole community but here the benefits are so little or insignificant so to say because long back they were very very visible but now i believe there is not much that these communities that i work with in lupani uh, in kwai in sotani in shavula uh, benefit from these resources maybe a new model has to be used but what i know confidently we are not uh, benefiting so far, since we formed our conservancy, we haven't done anything or to say, here we have built this, we have given such, no. So we don't know who. And for your own information, we are receiving this in other teachers. No one will be volunteer to assist a, a restocking while they know that on the other hand, you are killing. Looking for animals that are not there. You see, so that's why we are saying it's our wish to have this uh, uh, non-trophy hunting for maybe next seven years so that we restock our animals we realize but our heart is go into 100 percent non-consumptive type of tourism 
In 2019, the government of Zambia gave a trophy hunting company called Mbizi Safaris a permit to take 35 buffaloes from a national park to put onto its own property so that foreign hunters could shoot them for entertainment. However, the local community blocked the road in protest in order to stop the hunting company from removing them. After several hours, the trucks that had been brought in to transport the buffaloes left empty-handed. This is the situation in Mfue. The trucks, the trucks that we are fighting for to go, finally, they have gone. Leave our animals, please, in peace. Leave our animals in peace. Leave our animals in peace. Well done. Go, 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 go. Go, go. We will burn your trucks. Go. Go, go. One of the biggest issues that's been raised around trophy hunting is that of canned hunting, where animals such as lions are bred in captivity for the purpose of being hunted by trophy hunters and are shot within fenced-in enclosures. In Mikla is the producer of Blood Lions, a shocking documentary which highlighted some of the most barbaric practices by the industry. Here's what he had to say. I'm presenting to you today on behalf of the Bloodlines team, which is based in South Africa. Bloodlines has produced a feature documentary film, which exposes the predator breeding can hunting industries and a number of related commercial activities using these lions and other predators. We also run a global campaign that aims to bring an end to all the horror practices of these industries. I've been involved since the mid-1990s, uh, both as an investigative journalist and as a lobbyist, uh, in trying to end the practices. And one thing has been a constant over the last 20 plus years, and that is that both the number of facilities and the number of predators being bred and held behind the high fences on these farms has continued to increase. Today we're looking at anywhere between 10 and 12,000 animals, possibly more. So clearly um, our efforts uh, need to be stepped up to enact a legisl legislation that will help end the, the, the industry. And I think as the UK government uh, considers this proposal, um, there are four very strong reasons. First of all, these industries have no conservation value whatsoever. Uh, the entire community, whether these are the conservation NGOs or the lion scientists themselves, they are unanimous in their condemnation of um, the predator breeding industry and can hunting and um, have made it very clear that not a single one of captive, these captive bred lions are included in the conservation audit. I think secondly, there's no scientific value either to uh, breeding these animals and keeping them in captivity. Any legitimate scientist or researcher involved in a legitimate uh, project has access to hundreds of wild lions that are being um, that, that are found on our recognized private reserves. These are reserves that are run under ecological and scientific principles. And so, you know, the, the scientists have access to these animals. Um, there's no absolutely no reason to, to be breeding and keeping lions for scientific purposes. I think it's also important to point out that um, the can hunting activities have not taken any pressure of the demand for wild lion trophies, and they have certainly not benefited the overall populations of uh, wild lions. And so if you look at the graphs for um, canned hunts over the last 20 years, significant increase. If we look at the graph for the demand for, for wild lion hunts, it also increases. Um, yet we look at the graph for the overall lion populations across Africa, and these continue to fall. Um, so they've provided absolutely no relief whatsoever. Um, I think that we also need to look at ethical and moral reasons here. And we have to ask this question very seriously of ourselves here in South Africa, but also in the UK and the hunting community in general. Um, you know, where is the ethical or moral 
um, fiber involved in sanctioning these practices. In societies that like to re be regarded as progressive, um, is it acceptable that we brutalize 10 to 12,000 animals so that a few wealthy individuals are able to come and gratuitously kill them for a trophy? I think it would be very, very hard-pressed to find any uh, moral or ethical justification. And I think then, lastly, in this time of COVID, we've got to understand the risks of zoonotic diseases. And in a very recent study, 63 pathogens have been identified uh, that place humans at risk um, who come into contact with both wild and captive-held populations. And um, they run the risk of contact, contracting zoonotic diseases. And so I think if we take all of these reasons together, they form uh, a very powerful and coherent argument as to why the UK should go ahead and introduce a ban on the importation of lion trophies from South Africa. Uh, we thank you for your efforts and, and this initiative, and um, we hope that you will act in favour of lions. Professor Fred Berkovich is one of the world's leading wildlife biologists and has recently spoken out about how trophy hunting has been fueling illegal trade in body parts of giraffes as well as other animals. Giraffes have recently seen a calamitous drop in numbers. I spoke to Professor Berkovich a little earlier. Greetings everyone, I'm Fred Berkovich, an adjunct professor at the Wildlife Research Center in Japan and at the University of Free State in South Africa. I've been studying wild animals since I first went to Kenya in 1978. For a few thousand quid, you can get a permit to kill giraffe in South Africa, but giraffe are vulnerable to extinction. So how is it that killing an endangered species helps save the species? Giraffe numbers have plunged in history. When a young lad by the name of Boris Johnson went to Australia during his gap year, in 1985, there were about 150 to 160,000 giraffes in Africa. Today, if every single giraffe on the continent were to go to the University of Michigan football stadium and be seated in their reserve seats, there'd be about 10,000 empty seats in the stadium. The trophy hunting industry camouflages their ultimate purpose, which is simply to kill an animal and obtain a trophy, under the guise of helping local communities and assisting conservation. The legal export of trophies and body parts provides an avenue for the illegal trade in endangered species body parts because they're shipped together. The illegal killing of giraffes is one of the major threats to their continued existence. Giraffe bones are made into knife handles, while skins become cowboy boots and pistol holders, holsters in the United States. Trophy hunting can provide financial benefits to local communities in Africa, but if trophy hunting actually improves the socioeconomic status of local indigenous people, then the people living in the areas where hunting is permitted should have a much higher standard of living than those who are residing near national parks where hunting is forbidden. Not a shred of evidence supports that contention. Assume that hunting is a wonderful way for communities to benefit and to help conservation. Then isn't it simply the hunting that provides the benefit? Killing an animal ends up providing the same return as does trophy hunting. If a wealthy person can pay to kill an animal in order to send the stuffed, stuffed head home, then how come a local person can't kill the same animal in order to eat the meat? The illegal killing of elephants for their tusks is universally condemned, but you can buy a elephant trophy hunting permit for 40,000 pounds. This double standard is the epitome of rich white colonialism. In short, Trophy hunting masquerades as a conservation tactic by foreign white wealthy intruders who aim to kill endangered species for selfish reasons, but it has the side effect of providing an outlet for the 15 billion pound illegal wildlife trade run by criminal syndicates and funding the terrorist militia in Africa. Two British citizens knighted by Her Majesty the Queen exemplify the role that the UK has played in animal conservation, and I would ask the prestigious members of this group to continue to demonstrate to the world that you're walking in the footsteps of these pioneers. Sir Julian Huxley was the founding father of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and Sir Peter Scott was the godfather of the Red List. The IUCN Red List is a key document evaluating the threats to the world's biodiversity. In closing, I'd like to ask the Right Honorable Prime Minister a simple rhetorical question. When William Laurie Nicholas Johnson grows a little older, when he starts to wonder about the world around him, when he gazes at you with his big dark eyes, 
And when he asks, Daddy, what did you do to save giraffes, to save elephants, to save lions? How will you answer? Thank you. Professor Fred Berkovich speaking there. Trophy hunting is often associated with the killing of African big game, but trophy hunters travel all over the world to kill animals that they want to showcase back home, including South Pacific, Central America, Asia, and even the Arctic region, where they're allowed to kill polar bears, despite the fact they're one of the most endangered animals on Earth. There are just 20,000 polar bears today left in the wild. Morten Jurgensen is a polar bear expert who also runs photographic safaris, which are helping to fund polar bear conservation. He told us that trophy hunting could be an even bigger immediate threat to polar bears than climate change. Hello, UK. First of all, my condolences for the hit you're taking from this COVID situation. At the root of that pandemic, of course, lies our perverted relationship with the wild animals, just as that also lies at the root of the current biodiversity crisis that we're living through. A hunting trophy import ban would certainly be a step in the right direction. Thank you very much for this opportunity to briefly talk polar bears in that context. My name is Morten Jorgensen, Copenhagen. I have 20 plus years of experience as a tour operator and expedition leader in the Arctic, and I've written two books on polar bear conservation. During the middle of the 20th century, the polar bear as a species was already being hunted out. An international agreement to protect it was drawn up in 1973, but the agreement was never enough, and it only reduced the hunting pressure by about 25%. Since that agreement, we've lost between one-fifth and one-third of all our polar bears. As the only nation, Canada directly defies the agreement and has pursued a policy of intensifying and commercializing the polar bear hunting, including building, building a trophy hunting industry while other nations shut down theirs. Canada is the only nation today which not only allows sports or trophy hunting, but also engages in international trafficking of polar bear body parts. The pro-hunting hunting lobby successfully manipulates the numbers to camouflage the reality of the hunting regime. Furthermore, the later added threat from global warming is conveniently used to deflect from the effects of the slaughter. The polar bear being on Appendix 2 in the CITES system is an example of the failure of the CITES system to address overhunting urgently and prudently, highlighting again why a hunting trophy import ban should be comprehensive. All talk that you might hear that Canadian Inuit communities depend on polar bear killing and trading for their survival is nonsense. The combined trophy hunting and commercial hunting brings in about 4 million Canadian dollars per year to the Inuit communities. That evens out to about 67 Canadian dollars per person per year. Obviously not something the communities are surviving on. But yes, a few men, and mostly non-Inuit, do make a lot of money from the polar bear trade. But it cannot be called fair trade in any way. The continuation of polar bear trading is unsustainable. It's also unethical. And from a conservation point of view, it just has to end. Will Travers is president of Born Free, that's one of the many organisations that's part of a coalition of groups supporting a ban on trophy hunting imports. He sent us this message. My name is Will Travers. I'm the executive president and co-founder of the Born Free Foundation. And in this debate about trophy hunting, there's a lot of talk about numbers, economics, and morality. And of course, don't get me wrong, Born Free believes that it is entirely immoral to kill a wild animal for fun. But we also have a, a, an aspect of trophy hunting that's very rarely discussed, and that's the cruelty and suffering that it causes. One factor of this is that uh, trophy hunters often use methods of killing that are not clean and are not guaranteed 
to take an animal out without suffering. They use muzzle loaders, they use bows and arrows, they use crossbows. These do not bring about a clean kill and the animal can linger and suffer for hours. An example of that being Cecil the lion. Then there is the stalking and the chase aspect of it. An animal may be stalked and chased for hours, sometimes days, until it literally collapses with exhaustion before it is finally dispatched. Again, imagine the suffering. And then there's the non-target animals, those that are left behind in animal societies like prides of lions. You take out the male, you shoot the male as a trophy, another male will come in, take over the pride, kill the cubs so that his own genetic strain will be dominant. Again, imagine the suffering and stress that that pride of animals is now enduring. And then there is the sort of ultra horrendous end of the trophy hunting industry, canned hunting, where animals are raised and shot for fun with no chance of escape. And it's not just lions that we've all heard about. In one farm in northwestern province in South Africa, we're talking about lions, caracals, tigers, leopards, all found on this particular farm in extreme circumstances. No water, no shelter, disease was rife, overcrowding. It was unnecessary cruelty and suffering. We talk a lot in our society about preventing unnecessary suffering. Well, I think you'll agree that the suffering caused by trophy hunting is entirely preventable and completely unnecessary. A ban on the import of trophies into the United Kingdom will not necessarily end trophy hunting overnight, but it will send a powerful and compelling message from this country to the rest of the world that we will no longer take part in this grisly, gruesome, unnecessary, awful business. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Bertrand Chardonnay is a highly respected wildlife scientist who has had his work published by IUCN, amongst others, and has worked in a number of African countries and has extensively researched the issue of trophy hunting, including the industry's claims that the sport supports conservation, a position that he says the evidence emphatically rejects. Here's what he had to say. Hello, everybody. My name is Bertrand Chardonnay. I'm a wildlife vet, veterinarian, working in Africa now since more than uh, 30 years. During these years, I was able to witness the big changes. The first one is linked to the huge increase of human demography. Imagine that, for example, in the 70s, Kenya was around 15 million inhabitants. Nowadays, it's over 50. That is a big change. What was the consequence for the protected areas? Protected areas management is about two main points. The first one is law enforcement. And the second one is building and running a partnership with the local communities who are living next door. The cost of this law enforcement has tremendously increased over the year. And nowadays it is estimated to be around in Savannah, around eight US dollars per hectare and per year. For example, in Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service in charge of the management of national parks has got a budget of 14 US dollars per hectare per year. And that was the, the main point leading to the um, elephant population doubling over the last 30 years, which is a very good result. On the other side, what happened in the hunting areas? According to the trophy hunting lobby himself, conservation force, for example, in Tanzania, the richest uh, operators are operating there. Tanzania, they are uh, spending 20 US cents per hectare and per year. So that is just a very small fraction of what is needed, needed to protect wildlife and land. What have we seen during the, the last year? Since 10 years, close to two-thirds of the elephant population 
in Tanzania was poached out, and mainly in the hunting areas. So you can see that a private operation cannot fund properly today's law enforcement, and a fortiori they cannot fund if they have the know-how, which is not always the case, they cannot fund the um, partnership with local communities next door. The same conservation force is claiming that they are giving back 20 cents to the local communities per hectare and per year. But imagine if this local community is doing agriculture, they will get for themselves with the same hectare during the same year something between 200 and 400 US dollars. So the choice is easy. They don't need hunting. They need to have staple food and eat to make livelihood. So that is one point. If you go to the big data, Tanzania is about three, uh, sorry, 30 million US dollars per year, the turnout for big game hunting. The turnout for uh, wildlife tourism is 2.5 billion. So it's even not 2%, trophy hunting is even not 2% of tourism. It's the same thing all over Africa. Trophy hunting is 1% to 2% of the global tourism, which is um, based on wildlife tourism. If you go back to, to, to jobs, which is a very important point nowadays in Africa, Tanzania, which is using over 20% of its national ground for trophy hunting, on top of uh, 14 for national parks. Trophy hunting is uh, creating 4,300 jobs. At the same time, there are over 300,000 wildlife tourism jobs. So we are back to the 1% to 2%. It's the same thing even in, in Namibia, uh, where there are a human density which is very low. For example, the conservancies, it's about 80 of them now, run by, by communities and largely based on trophy hunting. The trophy hunting income for 20% of the country is less or around 4 million US dollars per year. 4 million to be shared by 300,000 people after they have taken of that the management cost. That is very few. And it is not a surprise that according to NAXO, the Namibian Organization for Conservancies, wildlife uh, numbers are decreasing since 10 years, including for draft resilient species like Rebsbok or uh, Springbok. So, not much hope for trophy hunting now in Africa due to, to economics. It's a private good. When you have an animal in the, in the wild, in a national park, that is a public good. Everybody can see it. When you kill it and you bring the trophy in your room, that is a private good. And a private good cannot be funded by public money. And the difference, biodiversity is a global public good that can be funded by public money. So you can see the fact, the fact that it is a private operation. This private operation is not making a lot of money. Most operators are operating at a loss. You cannot fund it with public money. And the difference, national park can be funded by public money. That is a huge difference. So now you will say, what shall we do? with trophy hunting areas. I would say that this question is now, in most cases, obsolete. Why? Open your eyes and go to the field. You will see that, that communities, they have taken back the ground for agriculture. For example, 40% uh, of um, hunting blocks in, um, in uh, Zambia which has an estate, a big estate, over 20% of the country. 40%, when you look at the satellite pictures, it is just agriculture. 
and it was claimed it is uh, it is uh, non uh, <coughs> it was not possible to crop on this uh, ground but it is rain are enough so slash burn crop that is the way they have done it and there is no way to take it back from the communities so in most cases the choice has been done what can be done in this uh, ground run now by a community it is to turn to sustainable agriculture sustainable forestry or sustainable agroforestry uh, f uh, to have an agriculture which is uh, climate change friendly and biodiversity friendly that is a big challenge then now you still have other area which are still managed by hunters situation is pretty bleak so now one point is to turn to state it's what has been done in tanzania lately where four or five uh, GM, uh, gma uh, or game reserve have been upgraded to a national park so that is very much possible and you should remind that not all the area of a national park can be used for tourism Sometimes you can listen that uh, hunters say, no, 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 it's not scenic. You cannot operate trophy hunting, um, photographic trips there. It's not the point. Consider, for example, Luangwa National Park. Luangwa, it's a, a huge area and 80% is not used for uh, tourism. It's just used for eco ecosystem services, carbon sink, water tower, uh, dispersal area for elephant and other wildlife during the rains, and so on. For it's an ecosystem. You don't need to do tourists everywhere, everywhere. So that is very feasible. The second point is that um, you can also uh, uh, set up community conservancies. That is done by local community that is very efficient as showed in in kenya for example very uh, efficient when it is uh, at the border of a national park or a game reserve like for example uh, masai mara so that is also a very good option working with communities so altogether you can see that trophy hunting future is not good and now we have the possibility to change to something which is more able to conserve a biodiversity and make livelihood for people in the future. Thank you very much. The Coalition to End UK Trophy Imports and Exports is supported by a number of conservation and animal welfare groups, some of them UK-based and some of them global organisations such as Humane Society International. Here, Arthur Thomas of HSI UK tells us what opinion polls tell us about what people in Britain really think about trophy hunting. My name is Arthur Thomas and I'm Public Affairs Manager at Humane Society International here in the UK. As part of our response to the government's consultation on a potential trophy hunting ban, we thought it was important to be able to demonstrate public support for the issue. So, in January, we commissioned YouGov to carry out a poll. The results of this polling show overwhelming support from the British public for a comprehensive ban on the import and export of hunting trophies. When asked, to what extent, if at all, would you support or oppose a ban on the import and export of hunting trophies, we saw total support of 80%, of which 70% strongly supported a ban. That support was consistent across the board. For example, of those who voted Conservative at the last election, 72% strongly supported a ban, and among Labour voters, 76% were strongly supportive. This is an issue which unites Leavers and Remainers, with more than 70% of both groups being strongly supportive of a ban. And, far from being a London-centric issue, support continues across the country with the Midlands and Wales, and the north of England, both showing 80% total support for a ban, 
compared to 76% in London. There's been a lot of debate recently about how a ban should be applied. Should we include all species, or just those listed as endangered, or threatened, or vulnerable? Among the British public, there is no debate, with a massive 76% responding that any government restrictions should be applied to all species, with only 14% wanting a ban limited to those which are threatened or endangered. The support for a comprehensive ban on all species rises to 81% among Tory voters and 79% among Labour voters, and again is consistent between Leavers and Remainers and across Britain. No animal should be killed purely for the gratification of the hunter, and it's clear that the British public agree. We urge the government to bring forward a comprehensive ban on the import and export of hunting trophies and end the UK involvement in this barbaric and outdated practice. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Arthur Thomas from HSI UK there. Um, now let me turn to Sir Roger Gale MP, the Member of Parliament for North Thanet and President of the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation. Sir Roger, thank you very much for joining us. First of all, as you've just heard, Conservative voters are strongly opposed to trophy hunting and overwhelmingly support a ban on trophy imports. Why do you suppose that is? I'm not remotely surprised by the findings because the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation and the Conservative Environmental Network have been attracting huge support across the board for environmental policies generally. Conservatives believe in looking after the world that we live in, that our children and our grandchildren are going to grow up in. It always used to be said within the Conservative Party of farming that you should live as if you're going to die tomorrow and farm as if you're going to live forever. Well, this has gone beyond farming to the whole of the rest of the natural world that we live in. And we have to look after that world as if we're going to live forever. And if we don't, then it won't be us, but it will be our children and our grandchildren that will pay a terrible price. And that's why I think Conservatives do feel very strongly indeed about this. And if I could just ask you personally, why do you, you believe that this particular issue is such an important one and that the government should move to stop imports of hunting trophies? We're losing endangered species, proud animals in the wild at a terrifying rate. If we don't do something about this now, actually yesterday, then the only big beasts left will be in zoos. Nobody wants that. We've already seen species brought to the verge of extinction. We still just have the opportunity to do something about that. And I think the concept to any conservative of the idea that it is proper, in order, acceptable in a modern, decent world to pay to fly to another country, go out into the wild, and with help from others, have lined up animals to then be murdered is appalling. And the, the way to stop that, or part of the way to stop that, is to prevent the import into the United Kingdom, the export from those countries, of trophies, of animal parts, which is all they are. It's revolting. Um, and if I can just probe into that a bit more, because so the Conservative Manifesto sets out very clear proposals for a ban on imports of hunting trophies from endangered species. However, as we were hearing just a little bit earlier, opinion polls suggest that actually what the public want is a ban on trophies of all species. So what do you believe that the government should do? I'm absolutely convinced that the government has the time, the opportunity to introduce a ban on trophies from all species now. Um, why not? Why should anybody really need a bit of a dead animal? 
to prove something to themselves and their friends. We should be glorying in the live animals that are left and looking after them, whatever their species actually, and making sure that we share this earth with them in peace and harmony. And that's not a romantic bunny hugging idea. That's how we ought to be looking after the world that we're going to live in for the future. Mm. Well, we've had now the government public consultation on uh, the ban on trophy imports and the various proposals uh, ended in February. And DEFRA had originally said that it was going to publish a summary of the evidence within a few weeks of that and then set out its proposals shortly after. Now, of course, coronavirus has completely derailed government business across the board. But there are those who say that, um, and you kind of suggest this yourself, that banning imports can be done swiftly, easily. It's a vote winner. So in other words, it's a political no-brainer. So why doesn't the government, to misquote the prime minister, just get the ban done? The pandemic is used for an excuse for not doing all sorts of things. Um, up to a point, of course, that excuse is justified. Government has had one or two other things on its mind, but nevertheless, we seem to be spending an enormous amount of time worrying about today's world without looking ahead and saying, yes, that's important, but we must also spend a lot of time and effort, if it's necessary, looking after tomorrow's world. And actually, to ban trophy hunting, to ban the import of trophies into the United Kingdom, can almost be done at the stroke of a pen. It doesn't require a massive bill to do it. It requires the political will and the determination and the decision. And I see absolutely no reason why this government cannot do that tomorrow. Well, my last question then is, um, let's assume that Boris Johnson is, is watching this. And it's certainly possible that some of his advisors are. Um, so what would your advice be to him right now? What's your message to number 10? Well, Carrie Simons. Um, who I think Mr. Johnson has a fairly close relationship with, is a patron of the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation, and we're very proud that she is. And we know that Carrie has used her endeavours to persuade Boris that we need to get on with this. And I hope and expect that she will be successful. We do need to get on with it. Um, I, I said in an earlier answer tomorrow. Well, actually, tomorrow is almost too late. We need to do it today. Sir Roger Gale, Conservative Member of Parliament for North Thanet. Thank you very much. Well, that's the end of this webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'd like to thank uh, Siobhan Mitchell, Director of the Campaign to Ban Trophy Hunting, for producing it, and to all the members of the Coalition to end trophy hunting imports and exports. Animal Aid, Animal Defenders International, Born Free Foundation, Campaign to Ban Trophy Hunting, Four Paws UK, Humane Society International UK, International Wildlife Bond, Lion Aid, One Kind, People for Peace and Nature, Protecting African Lions, RSPCA, Voice for Lions, World Animal Protection UK, and Zimbabwe Elephant Foundation. To find out more about the campaign, you can visit bantrophyhunting.org, follow us on Twitter at CBT Hunting, as well as find us on Facebook and Instagram. Details can be found on the website. Thanks again for joining. Goodbye.